I want you to turn your Bibles where, in many ways, this is somewhat of a part two to this morning's message. And I got some sobering things to share with you that I hope will encourage the dads here. And um, I am so proud of the dads of this church in a good way. You're fighting the battle. You're going outside the, the norm of even Christianity. And I hope that we've all awoken from sleep and realized the battle that we're in. We're in. David is, in verse 33, lamenting, crying, mourning over the death of his son Absalom. No doubt as he, if you know the text you read through leading up to that, David possibly had some regrets, but Absalom made up his own mind. Absalom could have followed the leadership of his father. David had some shortcomings, as you know. But I don't believe Absalom fell because of dad's inability, just not paying attention to his son. And we find in verse number three is he finds out his son, even though he was not supposed to, he was supposed to be spared and that was not done. And there'll be a price to be paid for that in the next chapter. But we see in verse 33, David, a father, not a king, a dad. A king would not care, a father is weeping. A king would say, my enemy has been taken care of. A father would say, look here, that's my son. And David said in verse number 33, and the king was much moved. He had just found out his son had been killed in battle, and he was supposed to be spared. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. Now just to let you know, that's in front of everybody. Joab didn't like that and others. But maybe Joab didn't know what it was like to be a dad. Maybe Joab had some things, we know he had some things to learn. He went up and wept over the gate and wept, and wept, and as he went thus, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son. Would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son. Lesson. From a famous father. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I pray for this message. I pray, Lord, you would guide and direct. Lord, thank you for the moms here. Thank you for the single moms as we talked about this morning. God bless them. Oh, Lord, help us. Thank you for the group that you've called to be here. And tonight as we look at dad, mom, sons, daughters, Lord, we pray that we will be right with God and help us as mistakes happen to be forgiving people, to be compassionate people. And remember that we are dads and moms first. Lord, guide and direct and fill me with the Holy Spirit. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Miles of distance separate us from Jerusalem here in Erie. Centuries of time have gone by since this event has taken place with King David. He was a king and most of us are just common folks. But I believe the differences may stop there. We can learn much about being a dad looking at this story in our present day world. Absalom was a broken son. Absalom was a son 
that David had that first committed murder, ran away, hid for a while. Yes, David should have reached out to him. He did not. Absalom then took all the accolades of the nation of Israel and people, overturned his father. He was a murderer. He was an immoral man. And he died a terrible death. And yes, David bears, if you want to look at the story, some responsibility to that. But everybody look here. Every eyeball on me. Every child, every individual, every person walking planet Earth, according to the Word of God, is a cannibal individually to God. You cannot stand by and blame everybody else for what you're doing. We're saved individually. We're converted individually. And we sin individually, even though there may be circumstances that allow that issue to be pushed a little further than it should be. Don't ever forget that. But sometimes in Christianity, there are certain spiritual zealots who want to hold their nose in the air and want to talk to you or to me or others and said, well, if you would have done so and so, that wouldn't have happened. I want you to tell them to go pound sand. Amen. How about having a little compassion of a grieving person? How about getting on your hands and knees and weeping for a father whose son is away from the Lord? A daughter who's gotten away from God? Can we love that individual who got away from God? Can we love that parent rather than behind them criticizing? Joab was doing that. You see in the next chapter, hey, what's he doing there? This is his son. By the way, he said, don't kill him. And you did that. Don't you come back to me. I mean, I assume most of you know the story. Proverbs 28, here we go. Proverbs 28, 13 says this. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And we know the book of Hebrews talks about this for they verily for a few days are chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening or discipline, disciplining rather, for the present seemed joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Everybody look here. Your son, your daughter, or maybe you. You're going through some chastening. You're going through a problem. Sometimes we take away God's chastening by eliminating the problem when God's trying to use that very thing to straighten them out. The next five minutes or so, I'm going to read something. There are copies on the Welcome Center. I'll preface preface, preface, preface this by saying I have been very careful not to read every word in here even though there's absolutely nothing in here that's inappropriate but I don't particularly want your children who are of younger age to be saying daddy what did pastor mean by X so I've tried to do my best job I can't say they're all going to be eliminated but you know my heart and there's nothing inappropriate going to be said here and there's nothing in this that I would not publicly post on my Facebook site or in an email. Nothing in this entire article. But I know there's young children in here. I said this morning, as we look at our culture, everybody look here. I'm burdened for boys. I'm burdened for the culture in which they're in. And you say, what about girls? Let me just say this. I have three of them. And my three girls had to marry boys. At least that's the way it's supposed to be, right? I'm burdened for boys. I'm burdened for dads because they're getting beat up and maligned and all around, and we just kind of take it. I want to read something to you. And before you get critical, let me finish the article before you get critical about what I'm reading. There's a blogger. 
For those of you who know what a blogger is, he writes a post on the Internet every now and then. His name is Matt Walsh. Don't agree with everything he says. I do not endorse it all. So don't type in Matt Walsh. He may write something, but I, I do agree with this one. There are copies of this out there. I read it to Rich Vogel. So if you don't like it, Rich sanitized it for me, so he's to blame too beforehand. Let me finish it. I'm going to spend some time on this, and I hope this really convicts you. Our culture is very bad for boys. Yes, it's bad for girls too. It's pretty much bad for everyone. But I think we fail to recognize and appreciate the unique struggles that boys face. Particularly we fail to recognize it because we're too busy worrying about the persecution of girls. Partly because we recognize it. Partly we fail to recognize it because collectively we don't really care much about boys. Now, before you say that, let me finish. We fail to recognize it because men aren't just going to talk about their own plight. A man will not talk about it because everyone, even his fellow men, will only laugh at him and downplay the problem. There are many factors at play here that lead to what we believe, and he's saying this now, a dire situation. Men are told about their privilege. We're told that we're abusers of women. We're told to take things honestly and see the evidence of your privilege over the last millennial. On the contrary, you'll see that boys have several disadvantages in today's culture. Let me give you four of them. The first one I'll sanitize. Not sanitize as bad, but I just got to be careful about words I'm going to use. Our culture, number one, preys on boys' weakness. The average 13-year-old boy, now this will be an assumption, a boy that's not in a Christian home, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything either. So this could be in a Christian home. And ladies, listen to me as I read this thing. Get out of your bubble and wake up. It's real and it's out there. And I'm not trying to bring this into your home, but I'm trying to tell you there's a battle that needs to be fought for our young men. And if you're a parent, you need to get aggravated and you need to get convicted. You need to go on your hands and knees before God. If you're older, an elder like me, you probably don't, none of this, this is all outside of your realm. Wake up. The average 13 year old boy has long been exposed to hardcore, you know what. And probably sees it every day. Puberty hits. I won't say the next three words. His brain is going crazy. He cannot help it because he's exposed to it and it's very much normal. The boy cannot escape it. It's on his computer. It's on his phone. It's on social media. It's on the TV. And it's all over the music he listens to as well. And by the way, say, well, that's not my home. Oh, you might be surprised. By the way, if you got internet and you got Wi-Fi, it's there. It's in this room right now. If you'll plug into it and hit the right website, you can do it right out in here. The boy cannot escape it. He goes to school and his female classmates are dressed like strippers. Everywhere he goes, immodesty is there. And we're supposed to say, just ignore it. It seems like everyone is doing everything they can to degenerate and creep out of him. The evilness that is natural to mankind. We ask for self-discipline and self-control. But yet we place all this in front of him. With no tools to develop and help him, he gives in to the temptation. Non-stop temptation, every day, everywhere, school, home, the public. Even as the boy possesses, even if he possesses almost superhuman moral fortitude required to pursue chastity and purity in the midst of this, I won't say the word, that engulfs him, he will only meet with mockery and discouragement from our society if he follows through. The very people who demand respect for women and self-control, well, the very people will harp, harp scorn on him if he tries to do that. The boy will need to call upon superhuman courage and the Holy Spirit of God, but yet he'll be cheered and rejected and called legalist. 
by anyone who sees what he tries to do to resist it. Most boys don't have the courage. Most boys, most adults do not have it, yet we expect our boys to have virtue that we as men never possess. So that's the first one. Now, if I look here, listen to me. Take your head out of the sand. These boys got to marry girls. So if you got girls, you better pray that they have a boy that's walking with God. Number two, there's a catastrophic lack of moral male role models. 17 million kids live without fathers. Now, listen, that happens here, and God bless you, and we do our job. I'm not, I'm not picking on that, and there are some horrific situations, and praise God for a church that becomes a father to the fatherless. I am not demeaning people at all in this area. Almost all kids have mothers, but very few have fathers. In some communities, it's over 80%. Two zip codes in North Philadelphia, just to let you know. Almost all kids have mothers, though, and mostly have female teachers. They're even more likely to have grandmothers than grandfathers that have an influence on them. A girl will have no shortage of female help and role models, a fact we're celebrating. There's nothing wrong with that. It's profound advantage that they have over boys, because boys have nobody. I don't care if nobody, we have us here, I hope. I hope this will get some of us convicted to stand up and be a role model. Even the boys who have dads don't have really role models. In most Christian homes, the father is not the physical leader, or the spiritual leader of the home, it's the mom. There are plenty of fathers who stick around but then refuse to take care of their children's moral formation through the Word of God. I'm adding some in this if you have a copy. This is, your copy may be different than mine. Some ways, fathers today are just warm bodies taking up space. By the way, these aren't my words, these are his, so I don't necessarily agree with everything. And perhaps bringing home a paycheck, but they neither lead their families nor provide worthwhile example to their boys. If a boy wants to know how to be a man, he'll have to depend upon his mother to show him. The ropes. Or turn to TV. And imitate whatever he sees on the screen. To learn about masculinity from musicians, movie stars, and superheroes. He'll develop a howl, hollow rather, cartoonish idea of manhood and will become a hollow cartoon man. What can we expect? It's hard to be a good man these days. It's nearly impossible if nobody even shows you. Well, what would Paul say? I commit thou to faithful men who should teach others? Where, 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 where are we at, men? Number three, I'm getting on. The education system today is designed for girls. And before you blow me out of the water, let me hear me out. I think you'll agree with me when I get done with number three. There's a reason how girls outperform boys in school. It's not because girls aren't smarter. Generally, they're the same. But they have an easier time because the classroom is set up to reward calm, organized demeanor this more natural to girls. Now, I'm not saying every girl is like that, but you know as well as I do, if you work with kids and you work with teenagers, there's a difference. How many of you know that God made boys and girls different? Say amen. Thank you. That's my cheerleader right there, little scarlet. Boys are more rambunctious. They have more physical energy. They're less capable to sit still and less able to function on a dull task for an hour in first grade. The typical classroom environment is torture for a boy. It penalizes him for being himself and for being who he is. Now, I'm not saying they should run around. They need to learn discipline, and neither is he. As a result, boys get lower grades. They're more likely to drop out, more likely to be expelled. They're twice as likely to be on drugs for ADHD. By high school... According to this, 20% of all boys are on some type of medication. By the way, a little side note, you get federal funding from the federal government for every kid that is diagnosed with that, and that supports the school system. Just thought I'd throw that one out. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not against that. Listen, I know there's good people that are on those type of drugs, and they need them. I'm not against 
intervention with drugs. Let me just say that. That's not my profession. But I think even the most neutral, sane person would say this thing's way out of hand. They never stop to ask themselves, why are boys on these drugs and more susceptible than girls? We never stop to consider that perhaps we're diagnosing boys for just being boys. If a school system was were not predicated on sitting, if a school system were not predicated on sitting still and memorizing things, and by the way, I know calculus, math, physics, and science. I am a high high level math person. I'm not trying to lift myself up, but the idea of memorizing and going to calculus and higher level math in college is the absolute worst thing you can do, and it doesn't work. The only place it works is in the public school system and even the Christian school system where they force you to memorize things rather than learn logic why it works. That's just my... We arbitrarily decide that every child must be sort of child that thrives in this environment. So we had to stuff pills in his mouth to force the issue. Girls are not drugged nearly as often as boys. Most of, uh, most of them are already the sort of people the school system prefers. They're quiet, they sit still, and we reward it. The system may not prefer girls, but it does prefer people who have characteristics that are more common than girls. Now, again, there's outliers of this. I'm not saying it's all true, but think about that just for a moment as these boys... Now, let me stop right here. I want to say something. It's a little different message. Everybody look at me. We as a church do a disarm to our children if we award quiet seat prizes just to the kid that's quiet. Because his heart could be as cold as the charred walls of hell, and he's sitting still, and the kid that God's really going to use could be bouncing off the wall. He just needs somebody to love him and to read a couple Bible verses to him. He really wants to be the next Charles Spurgeon boy or girl. I don't think we'll have a Charles List, a Cynthia Spurgeon or whatever, whatever. Number four, masculinity is being degenerated. You might think we've already done enough to these boys. We got one more. We've shoved the first point in their face. We've deprived them of role models. We force them to an education system that treats their personality as a disease. But we're not satisfied. In any case, we bury them in self-loathing. We call them privileged, potential monsters to be feared. By the way, if you're not in the culture, this is what is being taught. I know there's people out there that have done some wicked, vile things. And I am not defending that. And they need to be locked up and the keys thrown away. I am, will not ever defend that. But to castate an entire group of young men, that that's what you are if you act like a Christian male is ridiculous. Nobody would lab, label all women dangerous, dangerous, but potential monsters like boys would be feared. This wouldn't be so bad with the fact that boys are emerging from childhood. They're already emerging from childhood broken. They're no condition to endure the anti-male onslaught. So they just stay broken. They don't acknowledge they're broken. And they will not face the fact they're broken. And these are my words I added in, and I'm done. So I might as well just sit and play video games and chill out. Now, I'm not saying that's the end result. But ladies and gentlemen, as dads, can we be burdened for the little boys and the young men in this church? Can we burden for the girls of this church? And if you've got girls, you know what my wife and I, we... We got on our hands and knees, and we were scared to death of who our girls were going to marry. And by grace, God's grace, it's worked out. But can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we need to pray for our boys. And if you don't think what I said is true, I want you to talk to our two police officers who work in this church. 
I want you to talk to counselors like myself or Mr. Brandon. It's really, 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 really bad. Not in here. But we got to go out there. And we need dads that will pull their head out of the sand and start being a role model to their children. I spent a long time on that because I'm burdened. I almost want to cry because I'm seeing our culture just destroy young men. And we kind of flip it off. We kick the can down the road like it's not really happening. Did it take an article from Matt Walsh? I'm not even sure I agree with some of the stuff he believes. But did it take reading that and going through the scriptures to get us convicted? Did it take talking to Nate and Sam to hear what goes on in the, in the school systems and the culture and what's out there? Did it take hearing things that happen occasionally in, in churches and and we just kind of let our boys just give, you know, we don't, we don't love them. They're crying for our attention. Dads, moms. By the way, this message is just for moms as it is for dads. Wake up, moms. There's a cry of grief here. I'm going to shorten my message. I didn't plan to spend that long. There's a cry of grief. It's been so long, my iPad died. That's, well, somebody said that is good. There's a cry of grief. Extreme grief. He cries. And he stays up late and he's worrying it will not go away. If you can imagine David. And ladies and gentlemen, there'll be cries for us. We as parents, they're grieving. When our kids are away in college, you know, our kids were in a very protected home. They were raised here, and, you know, they were, praise the Lord for all the protection they had. I'm not a, I don't regret any of them, not one bit of it, ever. But when they went away to college, they didn't answer their phone. Or they didn't, we cried, and we, we prayed for them. And, yes, there have been disappointments over the years. Proverbs 17, 5 says, A foolish son is grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. And we, some of you have experienced that. Extreme grief. And dads and moms, in spite of your best intentions, your child rearing, the Lord Jesus Christ being number one in your home, sometimes they just choose wrong. They don't follow the Lord. The first public act of Absalom's life was to kill Amnon, David's eldest son, who had wrongfully abused Absalom's sister, Tamar. Absalom was not a good guy. He went on and revolted, as we said, forced his father out of Jerusalem, out of the kingdom. Turn to Luke chapter 15, and we're going to, not necessarily end here, but we're getting close. Probably 10 degrees warmer up here. I'll start loosening my tie. I'll be like some of those southern preachers. I'll start spitting out into the pews here. <laughs> Learn to Luke chapter 15. Guess what? Look here, dads. Wake up. Look what he did. His, his son had gone away, the prodigal son. Look at verse number 20, please. And he arose and came to his father. But he was yet a far way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned. Listen, whatever your kids do for crying out loud, give them compassion and grace like Jesus Christ gave you. And the last thing you want to do is dig in your heels or dig in your shoes and act like you are somehow some spiritually elevated person that won't it take forgiveness. But the father said to his servants, verse 22, bring first the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand. And I like the southern version of 
verse 22, and put slippers on his feet. Not shoes, slippers. How many wear slippers? Raise your hand. I love slippers. I, I'm getting old. I said I never wear slippers. Now I wear slippers all the time. Oh, my, it's so good to put your slippers on and just relax. I get that impression, right? Get that boy some slippers. <laughs> and bring the fatty calf and kill it and let's eat. And be merry, for my son was dead and is alive again. Always pray. Man, pray for that moment, mom and dad. we need to do the cry of failure we find in second samuel 19 verse number four but the king covered his face and the king cried with a loud voice oh my son absalom absalom my son my son let me say something this is the devil speaking absalom did what he did don't you blame it all on david and parents and dads, let me say something to you. Don't you go down that road. Jonah chapter 4. He was successful, but yet he failed. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life for me, for it's better for me to die than to live. That's the devil's lie. Elijah went through that. He wanted to kill himself. David had been immensely successful, but this is what bothered him the most. Turn to Romans chapter 14, please. Romans chapter 14, quickly, very quickly. Romans chapter 14. I'll get there as well. It's so hot up here, I'm literally dripping sweat on my Bible. Romans chapter 14. Look what it says in verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord... What's the next word? Say it. Every. That means everybody. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12. Don't miss this. So then every one of, say it, us, shall give an account of himself to God. Absalom can't say, you know, all that stuff I did, I disobeyed, I killed my, my brother, I get, you know, because of what you did to Tamar. You know what? It's my dad's fault. Dads, let me say something. I encourage you. Don't go down that path. If you messed up, your children still made the bad decision. God is still good. And you pray for that moment when they walk across the hill and you see them and you love them and give them a kiss and you hug on to them and tell them, thank you for coming home. God is good. Many today give up on their children. Fathers must not fall into the full responsibility of the character of their children. I'll close in one minute. I want to share one thing with you. I mentioned my pastor's family only because I've had permission before. He has three kids. The youngest one is giving him extreme grief. Three kids raised in one home. The youngest one is out to lunch. And pastor, my pastor, weeps and cries over what he could have done differently. But in the end, he will tell you, she made that choice. That doesn't make it any easier, but it is biblical. Because if we could pound the pulpit, say the right things, and check off the boxes. Everybody look here. We don't need God, do we? We just got to do all the right things. You need to be careful because we follow that line of thinking, parenting sometimes, and it gets us into big trouble, especially when it comes to raising boys. I was so excited. My kids talked to me today. I had text messages this morning, and I don't get into this Facebook thing. You know, every year on Facebook, Everybody on Mother's Day and Father's Day has to one-up everybody else about how great their parents are. How many of you notice that? I'm reading that and I'm going, really? They're not that good. 
So we did a Facebook boycott today. We're not going to talk about how great our parents are. I did a little bit yesterday on my dad. But, you know, I don't really care about sharing. I just want to tell them. So I talked to my daughter this morning. I talked to Tricia. Colleen called, and we did a FaceTime with the grids, and, you know, it was good. And then my son's over in um, Dublin, Ireland, and he called just a little while ago and said, Dad, it's 11 o'clock at night, and it's not even dark yet. And he said, uh, he prayed with me and told me that he loved us, and we'll see him in a couple weeks. And, you know, all of my children have done bad, but I love them all. But they're serving the Lord, and we're thanking the Lord for them. Give them grace. Give them grace. What parents do in moderation, you've heard me say this, children will do in excess. Be careful of your testimony. And lastly, we look, it was a cry of futility. Dave can't, David cannot bring Absalom back. He's dead. And he's crying. And I think sometimes it's an act of futility that we moan and groan over things we cannot change. But we can change the future and how we react to things. I'm done with this message. And if there's anything that I hope and I pray, everybody look here, I'm done, that you get out of this and I get out of this is the following. That we take our role seriously and we look at these little ones and realize that it's not a game. And what our mom and dad did, we can't do because that's not going to work anymore. We've got to step it up. I did not have an iPhone 7 Plus as a child. Steve Jobs was barely a teenager that time. We did not have Wi-Fi bringing in all that stuff everywhere you go, 24-7, everywhere. Yes, we as a church use technology. I'm not against it. It's like when the telephone first came out, churches were preaching against the telephone. Now, you know, we don't do that. I think that's somewhat ignorant to do that kind of ignorant statements like that. But I do believe that that 24-7 access to vileness and crime has desensitized our boys to the point they shouldn't even be married. Not our boys here. I'm not saying anybody here specifically. But that's the way it is. If you have a prayer, and here it is. Everybody look here. Let's pray for boys. Let's pray for our young men. Yes, we, got, we have some of the sweetest teenage girls here and ladies as well. But we need young men to stand up and take a stand. And we need young girls that don't buy into a marriage with all this stuff they inherit from this man that's seen everything. Right? Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. Two messages today that absolutely were not planned. At least this was. But I believe that the Lord is going to use this to help us out. 